1981, NASA returned to space for the first time in six years, beginning the lifespan of what would become the very symbol of spaceflight for decades to come, the Space Shuttle. That year, two test flights successfully took it to orbit, testing the orbiter and the new remote manipulator system, also known as Canadarm. But when a failure of one of Columbia's fuel cells resulted in the STS-2 mission being cut short, the planned tests could not be completed in their entirety. On March 22, 1982, the mission of STS-3 would complete these objectives and put the new orbiter through an extensive endurance test to prove the capabilities of the winged spacecraft for nominal flights planned for later that year. As this flight was still during the space shuttle testing phase, STS-3 would carry a crew of only two, rookie astronaut C. Gordon Fullerton, whom had served with the space shuttle program during its approach and landing tests, and Skylab veteran Jack Luzma, making his second and last space flight. Luzma was originally scheduled to fly the original planned mission of STS-2, intended to rendezvous with Skylab and boost it to a higher orbit. However, when the shuttle development fell behind schedule, due primarily to the thermal protection system, Skylab was deorbited and its rendezvous mission was abandoned. Now Luzma's mission was a marathon shakedown of Columbia, the only spacecraft in history to return to space for a second and now third time. During the first two flights, the entire shuttle stack was white, aside from the black surfaces of the orbiter. During processing, the external tank was painted white in order to protect it from ultraviolet light as the shuttle sat on the pad waiting for launch. This proved to be of no real concern, and for the first time the tank was left unpainted, revealing the rust-colored spray-on insulation, which gave the tank its trademark orange color that would persist throughout the program's remaining lifespan. With the fuel cell problem corrected and all anomalies resolved, STS-3 takes to the sky in what would one day become a familiar sight to millions of Americans, as recognizable as the Stars and Stripes itself. Upon reaching orbit, Columbia was given a go for its seven-day mission, and upon some careful monitoring, the fuel cells all performed perfectly. It was now time to open the payload bay and begin tests, which not only involved operational testing of the remote arm, but a special payload rack housed in the back of the bay. And for the first time in the shuttle's history, scientific instruments and experiments were also housed inside the shuttle mid-deck, which Luzma and Fullerton complete during flight. Things immediately took a turn for the uncomfortable, however. First, the old Apollo adversary had returned. Space Adaptation Syndrome. Not violently, but both men had experienced a period of nausea as their bodies adjusted to the weightless environment. Further, the spacecraft was equipped with a special toilet, which the crew could use with moderate efficiency and a bit of practice. However, after its first use, it malfunctioned. And this problem would persist throughout the entire flight, which Luzma would later describe as eight days of colorful flushing. But this wasn't the big issue that would impact the flight. During the mission, heavy rains began in California, causing flooding at the landing site at Edwards Air Force Base. Since the landing strip was essentially just a dry lake bed and not a maintained concrete strip, landing the heavy space vehicle on the rain-soaked dirt could be catastrophic. At the time, Kennedy Space Center in Florida was not fully equipped to facilitate a shuttle landing, and the crew were not trained on such an approach. Fortunately, there was a backup, which they were trained on. A Northrop-run lake bed testing field at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. This facility was used for training shuttle pilots since 1976, and was selected as a backup landing site while the shuttle landing facility at Kennedy was still in development, and both Luzma and Fullerton were well trained on making landing approaches at this site. Also, equipment was already installed on site for just such an occurrence, but some additional transport was still required. Transporting this equipment would require the use of Air Force cargo planes, but NASA was hesitant to proceed, as it would have required an expenditure that their shrunken budget couldn't fully handle. The alternative involved the tried and true method of transporting cargo by rail, utilizing the Santa Fe Railroad and Southern Pacific Railroad 
finally tallying a total savings of $2 million in transportation costs. White Sands was not quite ready yet though, as high winds persisted throughout the area, causing poor visibility and less than ideal landing conditions for the unpowered glider of a spacecraft. This is where the eight days came into play, as the mission was extended for an additional day to wait for conditions to settle. By this point, all mission objectives were completed, leaving little for the crew to do on their remaining day. Little, that is, except for staring out the shuttle windows at the view below, giving them a chance to truly enjoy being in what Luzma described as our world's favorite vacation spot. It was now time to come back home, Columbia having performed beautifully, firing its Ohm's engines at the alternate approach window, then pitching back forward to begin its sweeping approach through the steadily thickening air. During descent, the autopilot controlled portions of re-entry, but was not programmed to bring the shuttle to a complete landing yet. This required Luzma to take periodic manual control as Columbia began to turn on final approach to the runway. Autopilot was re-engaged, but would do something interesting. All instrumentation showed the shuttle was on course and on energy, basically meaning the glide speed was adequate to reach a nominal landing. Despite this, the autopilot closed the speed brakes completely, increasing the approach speed. Moments later, the autopilot ordered the speed brakes to open full, then closed again. While this presented concerns, Luzma carefully watched the approach, ready to take control at a moment's notice, keeping the autopilot on to monitor and collect data on this odd behavior. As the landing drew near, he finally shut it down completely, taking full manual control. Landing gear deploy, and Columbia makes its touchdown approach, but shortly after back wheels make contact, the nose began to rise. This was not supposed to happen. Fullerton quickly warned Luzma that the auto land system was still partially engaged, and he quickly locked it down and brought the nose to a gentle touchdown. If the nose had pitched up too high, Columbia could have potentially ended up in a backflip, which it could never have survived. The quick realization saved the vehicle, and likely their lives as a result. This would be the only time White Sands would be utilized during a space shuttle landing, and in later years Edwards Air Force Base would be itself delegated to alternate landing site, all shuttles coming straight to Kennedy Space Center in Florida. But even with this last minute change, the mission of STS-3 proved a complete success, and its adventurous landing standing out as a moment that neither astronaut would ever forget. A moment that will forever mark this week in space history.